Welcome and, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Doug Dennerlein. I'm the CEO of BetterWorks. I'm also the former president of Success Factors, where I grew my love of what's going on in the OKR and CFR space. I've been here for about two years. I was actually recruited by our guest speaker today, John Doerr, who is also the lead investor in BetterWorks, along with Jason Green from Emergence Capital. Not that John needs an introduction, but you know, it's worth noting a couple incredible things about John. You know, he's an engineer, an engineer by education. He's an acclaimed venture capitalist. He's a chairman of Kleiner Perkins. And for more than 38 years, John served entrepreneurs with integrity, optimism, bringing ideas uh, were spreading to disruptive leaders and teams. In 2018, John authored Measure What Matters, a handbook for setting and achieving audacious goals. Through this book and platform, Measure What Matters, he shares values and valuable stories and lessons from innovators. John was the original investor and board member at Google and Amazon, if you can believe that, helping to create over 500,000 jobs and to help create two of the most valuable companies on the planet, really. He's passionate about helping entrepreneurs reimagine the future from healthcare transformation to machine learning. Outside of Kleiner Perkins, John works with entrepreneurs for change in public education, the climate crisis, global poverty, John serves on the board of Obama, the Obama Foundation and One.org. We're also joined by John's investing partner today, Ryan Pecham Saram, who is the former U.S. Deputy Chief Technology Officer at the White House. And we owe the fixing of Obamacare, if you will, to Ryan and his leadership and fantastic guy. We're here also with Lisa Shufro from the Chief Storyteller from Measure What Matters and is very close to the Measure What Matters and John Doerr story. So, for today's webinar, John will give a short presentation to kick things off. We'll move into a section where John and I will do a kind of a question and answer about what's going on with OKRs in this work from home time and how the, the world has changed for all of us and how maybe OKRs and CFRs can help in this time. And then we'll open it up for whatever remaining time we have to the audience for question and answers, a chance for you to reach out via the Zoom application and the Q&A button to ask John whatever questions you'd like to ask John. And I think lastly, an incredible offer that John is making for everybody is if you uh, uh, send John an email and I'll give you his email address at the end of this, I'll give it to you now too. It's, it's you know, jdor at Kleiner, per, it's kp, kpcb.com uh, and tell him what your three current favorite books are He'll respond back by sending you an email back of his three favorite books and a signed copy of Measure What Matters. So pretty amazing offer. I think it's fantastic, John, that you're here with us today. Thanks for doing this with me. And with that, let me hand it over to you to kind of get started with things. Well, thanks very much, Doug, for that introduction. And uh, I will tell you among my three favorite books, uh, one, one of them is not this book. <laughs> it's three others that I, I want to introduce you to. So. Uh, let, let me see if I've got control over the slides. Aha, one moment. There we go. This, uh, th this uh, book, though, can uh, save you some time. And by that, I mean, you're welcome to take notes to the presentation, but I will send you the set of slides if you uh, send me your three favorite books as, as an extra incentive. It's, it's not really a business book, as it turns out. It's, it's more of a story book. It's a collection of a dozen stories about innovators and leaders in small organizations, in startups, in nonprofits, and for-profits, and how they set goals, really aggressive goals, get everybody aligned in pursuing them. And, and I think it's important to keep in mind why it is that this matters so much. And some would say matters more now than ever before. And, and, and I like to say that there's five real benefits that you can get and you should put out to motivate someone adopting a, a transparent goal system. The first of these is focus. So we choose among the few things that really matter. The second is to get everybody on your team aligned pulling together as opposed to going in different directions. The third is to get a level of commitment that goes beyond someone telling you something's important, uh, that you have declared to your team and your coworkers 
that this is a priority and it becomes a kind of social contract. Your reputation is on the line to track your progress quarter by quarter, month by month, whatever frequency, whatever cadence, sometimes weekly in your staff meetings against these few focused things that matter and to do so in an environment where it's okay to fail, where you set stretch goals. And oftentimes people say, if I get a grade of 70% on my OKRs, that's a good grade, that, that, that's a good outcome. If you constantly achieve 100% of them, well, you might be sandbagging, <laughs> not stretching far enough. And on the other hand, if, if you only get 30 or 40%, that, that's a sign that there might be another kind of problem. Now, developing a robust, really vital uh, uh, goal system takes time. It takes muscle. There's learn goal muscle, I like to call it. There's learning associated with it. But the, all these combined together, I like to say, as a mnemonic, are just the facts. They're the essence of a, of, of, of a good and robust goal system. Now, I was first exposed to this system in 1975 when I came to Silicon Valley as a kind of long-haired electrical engineer. I had no job, no girlfriend, no place to live. <laughs> but uh, I, I landed a summer job at a small new chip maker by the name of Intel, just around the time that they'd invented the microprocessor. And this is Andy Grove. He was uh, not the CEO in the beginning. He was the chief operating officer. But Andy, Andy really made the trains run on time. And, and, and he also believed that the role of a leader of an organization is to be an educator. And in fact, till the very end of his life, he taught courses at Stanford and, and, and had all his senior executives teach. And so now I'm gonna share with you a very rare piece of video. This is a classic, you can't find it on the web. And this is Andy Grove in 1975 teaching a class that I happen to be part of on objectives and key results. Here it comes, turn the volume up on, on your, your computer right now. Here's Dr. Grove. The two key phrases of the management by objective systems are the objectives and the key results. And they match the two purposes. The objective is the direction. The key result has to be measured, but at the end you can look and without any argument say, did I do that or did I not do it? Yes, no, simple. That's vintage grow. No arguments. Yes, no. Did I get it done? Did I not get it done? A very simple system. So objectives and key results, or OKRs as they're fondly referred to, O's being the objectives, KRs being the key results. Well, th th they're really two sides of, of any important goal. The objectives are what we want to have accomplished. Remember, reviewing the objectives are what we want to have accomplished. The key results are how we're going to get it done. What and how, objectives and key results. Now, really good objectives are significant, concrete, very much action-oriented, and they're inspirational. They would be a goal that might live for a long time, or there may be a development like a pandemic or some other change in the market that renders those irrelevant, in which case you just change them. But they're what we wanna have done. The key results are how we get it done. And good key results are specific and time bound. They're aggressive, but realistic. We talked about having stretch goals and they're also measurable and verifiable. Uh, one of my students in OKRs Marissa Mayer, who ran product at Google before she left to run Yahoo, was fond of saying, if it doesn't have a number, it's not a good key result. And so I want to tell you a few stories from my storybook of uh, how people use objectives and key results. Uh, maybe the place to start is, uh, is, is back in when would it have been? The late 90s, I guess. And uh, I was in a garage with two 24-year-old entrepreneurs telling them about, in fact, showing them this slide set using Andy Grove's training slides for OKRs. And of course, those two entrepreneurs in their garage are 
Larry Page and Sergey Brin. And I went through my presentation and at, at the end of it, I, I wanted to ask him, you know, are, do you like this or are you gonna use it? And Larry Page really, he was kind of quiet at the time. He didn't have anything to say. I'd like to tell you that his partner, Sergey Brin, was really enthusiastic. He said, okay, John, we're gonna go for it. But the truth of the matter, what he said was, you know, we don't have any better way to manage this company, so I guess we'll give this a try. And I, I took that as a, as, as a ringing endorsement. And to this day, every Googler, 100,000 of them, every quarter, writes down her objectives and key results, publishes them for everyone to see, grades those from the last quarter, and then sets them aside because they're not used for bonuses at Google. They're not used for promotions. They're used for a higher purpose, which is to get collective alignment on the things that matter the most. And I remember talking to Andy Grove while he was still with us. And he said, you know, John, I think Google has embraced OKRs more effectively than any organization I know, including Intel. So if you talk to any Googler about OKRs, whether they do them today or whether they've taken them from Google, to some other organization, uh, you may be surprised by the answer. It's, it, it's a resounding yes. So I have another story to tell you that's in the book about Google. This is Sundar Pichai when he was a product manager in charge of a new browser. Do you guys remember the internet back in 2007, 2008? Well, it was slow and the browser was slow. It was Internet Explorer that I think, and a lot of us were on dial-up kinds of modems. And uh, Larry and Sergey gave Sundar the assignment to make the world's best browser, to make one that was really very rapid, starting with literally nothing and a pretty, pretty well-established and functional competitor. And so Sundar spent a lot of time doing something really important. He got very clear about what the objective should be and how he would measure it, the objectives and the key results. And so his objective was, I'm gonna make the world's best browser. Larry and Sergey had expressed that as they wanted a state-of-the-art platform for advanced applications that could run securely, blah, 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 blah. He turned that into, we're gonna make the world's best browser. But then the important part was, how am I gonna measure my progress against it? And he said, well, I could do it by revenues or click-throughs or any one of a number of metrics, ad, ads, but instead he chose simply by number of users. And then for the next three years, he stayed with that goal. In fact, in the first year, he set a goal to have 20 million users of Chrome and he missed it by a mile. He only got 10 million users. In 2009, he upped the ante to 50 million users. Same objective, build the best browser, but as measured by, those are the magic words, the number of users. And they got to 38 million, almost 70%. In 2010, he raised the bar again to 100 million users. And this time with greater speed, enhanced distribution, doubling the marketing, he blew the number away. He got to 110 million users. Now, I love that story not so much because it has a happy ending, but because it, it shows the power of choosing the right objectives, having them be nearly timeless and staying the course quarter after quarter, year after year. Uh, sometimes the power of OKRs comes from being able to change course and change course rapidly. One of the stories in this book is how Intel responded to the threat of almost losing its position in the entire microprocessor industry. But that's a story for another day or another night. Sometimes I'm asked questions about, John, don't these OKRs kind of stifle creativity and, 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 and diminish a team's willingness to take on risks? And uh, I, I say no, but I think it's even better for you to hear from who might be an unlikely adopter of OKRs. The world's uh, greatest rock star, Bono, who uses them in his nonprofit one to focus everybody on eliminating global poverty. And 
Here's what he has to say. Turn your volume up a little, please, about OKRs and culture and innovation and risk taking. So you're passionate? How passionate? What actions does your passion lead you to do? If the heart doesn't find a perfect rhyme with the head, then your passion means nothing. The OKO framework cultivates the madness, the chemistry contained inside it. It gives us an environment for risk, for trust, where failing is not a fireable offense. And when you have that sort of structure and environment, and the right people, magic is around the corner. Gosh, I love that. Think about that. It creates the kind of environment where it's okay to fail, where you can innovate. If you get the right people and the right goals and trust, uh, magic is right around the corner. Still gives me kind of goosebumps to hear it. So, uh, Doug, that's a quick overview of OKRs, where they came from, what they're about. I'm sure many of the people who've dialed in know this already. So I'm going to turn it back over to you to okay. field questions and drive us forward. Okay. Well, thank you, John. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think probably the biggest question that's on people's minds is in this current environment where, you know, uh, people are home, not but you know, by themselves in some cases with their families, uh, their managers are distant from them. It's, it's a new form of leadership in terms of managers and, and employees interactions, you know, how can, how do you feel like OKRs could help in, in this current environment? Well, that's a great question. You know, I, I think for the foreseeable future, employers are going to give employees a lot more choice about where they work and how they work. And, you know, there's been up until now a lot of happy talk about agile organizations and leading and managing in a real time kind of way. But I think it was more talk than substance, but suddenly with a thud, you know, now we're all doing this. There's no choice about this. We, to be effective, you've got to meet, you've got to communicate, you've got to have transparency about where you're going. Uh, a, a number of these insights I give Josh Burson credit for as one of the uh, leading experts on, on goal setting and getting high performance from teams, but a system like this OKR system or the Better Work system really creates transparency uh, where, where it was never before. You know, I, I wrote a blog that was actually published today about the fact that uh, the way that you use OKRs today <clears throat> really gives an employee all the way through the organization the ability to see everybody's goals and everybody's progress on those goals. I think another important thing maybe you could talk about is you know, one of, the, one of the benefits of OKRs versus what I grew up with when I was at Cisco Systems, we had an annual planning process, was we created these goals with the beginning of the year, we put a tremendous amount of work into them, and then we kind of put them in a drawer. It is with OKRs, the ability to alter those along the way, given the circumstances, is pretty powerful, is it not? It's powerful, and I think it's essential. Uh, look, uh, whether you're a millennial worker or a seasoned leader, uh, providing real-time feedback and real-time uh, 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 tracking against the, the ever-changing world is, is essential. And I think it's important for every organization to choose the cadence with which they adopt these. Uh, but I've observed over time and that could be quarterly, it could be monthly, but the places that really use these to advantage, uh, they're, they're not checking them every day, but they become part of the, the weekly rhythm in the language of an organization. They're, they're used in staff meetings, they're used in one-on-ones, in one-on-one -on -one meetings. So mm -hmm. uh, I, th I, think, I think OKRs become the lifeblood of uh, operating in this new world. Yeah, I think what I mentioned in my blog too, I, I read an article where somebody was putting technology on laptops. It showed when people were using the keyboards and not, and, you know, I, I think that's, you know, two big brother kind of thing. The, the, a fact of what an OKR does is let you see achievement, which is probably a more important goal. 
you know, John, you, you've been, I don't mean to age you, but you've been around through multiple downturns, the, the dot com, you know, bust, um, you know, the downturn in nine, after 9 11, 2008. Have you have any experiences you can share with us in those times when people used OKRs to help them pivot when the world changed on them? Well, uh, one, one of the stories that's in the book is the way Andy Grove on 45 Days Notice pivoted, uh, pivoted the entire Intel organization, which at the time I think was several thousand people to, uh, without inventing a, a, a single new product, reposition their uh, marketing, their technical data, their application support, and their field engineers. And Intel would not be the company it is today. It might not even be around except for having made that change. Uh, similarly, you know, Larry Page and Sergey Brin in, in, in 2008 wrote a really beautiful OKR that captured people's attention. They said, we want to make the web as fast as flipping through a magazine. And I don't think any of us would have embraced the internet if, to the degree that we have if it didn't get to be orders of magnitude faster, which they've achieved. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm also getting some good questions from, from the group too, John, uh, even, but you know, one of the questions is if people are on an annual process today, what's the mechanisms to get it to move to something that's more continuous or more OKR oriented than a one-time event? That's a, that's a great question and I'm actually, working through this right now with another company that I'll name Nuna, where they use OKRs annually for the company and for the teams. But the leadership has set a goal by the end of the year to have OKRs for every individual in this rapidly growing company. And so their way to do it is by example. At the last all hands meeting, when they reviewed the OKRs for the company and the team, each of the leaders also stood up and said, here are my individual OKRs and graded, uh, transparent. And they're not just inheriting the company ones. These are the things, you know, the CEO, she's going to be responsible for the relationships and advancing certain accounts. And uh, I, 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 you can put in place a dual timing track. That's to say that you have annual OKRs as well as quarterly ones. And the annual ones are reminders of where you want to be at the end of the year. The quarterly ones tend to govern more of the immediate behavior. Have you seen that with most of the clients you're working with or do companies settle for annual OKRs, Doug? No, no, they, they well, but the way we try to communicate to people is, of course, there's many of your goals that are annual achievements. It's what are you doing this quarter to help move the ball forward to make sure you achieve it on an annualized basis. Great. And trying to break it down into more quarterly functions. Um, John, maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, we talk, talk about OKRs and CFRs, conversations, feedback, and recognition as the other chew on the OKR foot. Can maybe talk a little bit about how people totally. use the CFR? I'd yeah, I'd love to talk about that. I, I like to describe them as a sibling, the uh, twin sister or, or, or brother for OKRs. Because OKRs set the goals. In a, a football analogy, they, they are the, the, the goal line is the objective. And the key results you can think of as being the 10-yard markers. I've got to advance 10 yards to retain possession of the ball and stay in the game. But they're by no means everything that's going on in the game. CFRs are everything else. They're the conversations, the feedback, and the recognition. That's calling the plays in the huddle. That's the work you do before the game and reviewing game tapes to, to, to learn about it. And so that feedback in the moment that you as a leader give to your team or you get for yourself is, is crucial. I mean, you can't imagine winning a football game or a Super Bowl without those added elements. And, and especially with this new generation of millennial workers, uh, what I've found, if, if I can venture into that, Doug, is, is that they really want to see the big picture. They don't want to be micromanaged, but they do want 
constant feedback and on the spot, quick and rapid feedback. And so the CFR component of the Better Work system is one of the really remarkable things that allows your people ops or HR leadership to uh, set up a regular rhythm for feedback and user surveys um, and, and, and connects those to the OKRs in a, a really very uh, coherent way. Yeah, it, it, I, I would tell you, John, we find it very important that if, if it's just someone going into the application and providing updates to their goals, without a conversation around it, it, it feels kind of weighty to the employee or the individual contributor. What the benefit is, is sitting down with their manager on a regular ongoing basis and getting feedback about how's it going? What, what roadblocks did you hit going, trying to achieve your OKRs? How can I help you as a leader remove those roadblocks inside of what you're trying to accomplish? So a super important part of this, I think, uh, in terms of making it a, a value to the person who's providing feedback on the OKRs they're working on. Yeah, another, another insight that Josh Burson shared with me and, and, and I've observed is that in this new world of work, this new COVID, post-COVID, hopefully soon post-COVID era, we've got much more distributed authority. There's central operations, but you want the team leaders in a city, in a unit, to have guidelines, good data, but let those teams run themselves as locally as they possibly can. And, and I think the only way you can get there effectively is by building trust. And so the transparency in OKRs, together with uh, the investment in, in frequent feedback and CFRs, creates a, a much more trusting environment. You know, John, maybe you could comment too. Some of the things that we, we certainly run into with people trying, with leaders that really want to move to an OKR methodology, um, you know, it's, it's a big change management process that people go through. And sometimes they go, well, why don't I just do it with my leaders and try that for a while and see how it goes. Is there a benefit to trying it that way? Or is the, is the ability to see the transparency and be p connecting people at the lowest level in the organization important? One of the stats I always I remember from Josh in Deloitte uh, is 78% of people in an organization don't really understand how a, how their work actually helps a company achieve its goals. Yeah, I have, a, I, I have a, a quote in the in the book. It's from Aaron Levy, and he says, uh, "Ryan, what's the number? 30% at any given time, 30% of the people." He says in an organization, but the real quote was he said, "30% of the people at Box." are working on the wrong thing. And then he added the challenge is to figure out which 30%. So uh, I, that you get so much clarity from writing down and declaring publicly and honoring it, not just having this be some kind of work tax. This is additional work. When you... Hey. John, we lost your, we lost your, uh, I, I unmuted you. There, I am. there I'm back. Is that good? <laughs> what, I, what I was trying to say, Doug, is that especially in the early days of adopting OKRs, it's going to be work. It's going to take time to build up your goal muscle. But in the end, I, I mean, 100,000 people are, at Google are doing this uh, four times a year. And from start to finish, there's no more than a week's worth of time that elapses. Maybe it's a half day. Would you take a half day, a quarter to get your team aligned, focused, and stretching for the right goals and accountable? That's why I think in the beginning for leaders or individuals, it's important to remember this mnemonic we opened with, which is the facts. You've got to consistently make sure that the organization understands why uh, we're putting so much effort and energy into it. And it's so we can empower our people and be operationally excellent. Hey, Ryan, how important is it that, that leaders support the implementation of an OKR culture? It's, it's critical, Doug. I mean, without that, then, you know, you are doing OKRs in a vacuum and it really sets us up for kind of an unsuccessful rollout of OKRs. And so we like to say, you know, 
from an executive leadership team, like the CEO needs to own them, or if uh, you're on a smaller team, the team lead, the department head, someone's got to really own the goal setting process. And, and Doug, as you asked that question, I was looking through the Q and A, and I might kind of throw this back out to to you and John. But you know, here uh, is a question from Brock. You know, we've uh, brought in to using OKRs, but they're having trouble selling it to their executive team. What's the best way to communicate this to the top and to get them to buy in using OKR? So there's belief in the ranks, but leadership, um, getting them on board, what's the best way to do that? Doug, you wanna take that and I'll follow up. Okay, yeah, great. I, I, we do see that, uh, Ryan, and unfortunately more often than not, uh, the best way we've seen to get buy-in is find an OKR champion in the organization at the highest level possible and implement OKRs throughout that organization all the way down to the individual contributor. And then people can see the progress that there's, they'll start to achieve better and, and more likely outcomes than the rest of the organization. That gets the interest of the leadership along the way to say, wow, this seems to be a thing that works. Uh, the other thing is, you know, just giving us access to those leaders and we can show them some t tricks on how to, you know, how, why it's important that they're involved in the process and show them the benefits of others that they've accomplished by getting involved in trying a new process versus the one. Because everybody, every company is trying to do some level of planning or goal setting, correct? Many of them just don't do it very effectively. I tell the story in the book of Intuit, and it's a perfect example of what Doug's telling us, namely the head of IT. Uh, which chapter is that, Ryan? Uh, the Atticus Tyson chapter, Intuit. At Atticus, Atticus Tyson, it's page 102, chapter nine in the book, uh, was Googling about goal setting. And he found OKRs, and then he found, as it turns out, better works. And he said, I'm gonna adopt this through my, I think it's an 1800 person organization in three different time zones all around the world. And so he proved it out. He was personally incredibly committed and now it's spread to more than 7,000 employees inside Intuit, which is an exceptionally well-run company. 8,500, actually. <laughs> there, there you are, more than 7,000. And, and um, you know, they can't imagine running. They've been doing this for years. They can't imagine running Intuit without it. Just like Google can't imagine, Eric Schmidt said he can't imagine running Google without this goal-setting system. Yeah, maybe I can ask this question too, John. We've heard this before. You know, well, well, we're not Google. You know, we're just this small company or we're 5,000 people or we're 100 people. Do OKRs work for a company that's not Google? Yes, and it matters even more when you're small. So uh, a company that I've backed called Visby, formerly known as Click Diagnostics, deeply committed to OKRs. I went down and gave them my usual... Johnny Appleseed OKR talk. And they said, you know, John, once our company got to be more than 24 people, more than we could fit around two lunch tables in the cafeteria, people needed a way to know what's going on. And they're up to hundreds of people right now making some really innovative tests, including for the coronavirus. They would not have been able to achieve what they've already done without using OKRs. There's a website that I have that has a lot of stories, as does the BetterWorks website. But copy down the, the name whatmatters.com, and you'll find a, a lot of additional stories of, of, of users. Uh, large companies, small companies, nonprofits, for profits, even families. I, I'm on this mission, and I'd love for everybody on this webinar to join us to take OKRs thoroughly into our institutions that matter the most. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I've seen them used in families. I'm seeing them used now by governments. I thought the last place in the world that would be want to take a public risk would be uh, an agency of the administration. But uh, Medicare and Medicaid, 7,000 people, a trillion dollars of taxpayers' expenditures has thoroughly embraced OKRs top to bottom. Large hospital systems, you'd think the last place you'd tolerate risk would be with OKRs. Uh, the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic told me the most important thing we're going to do this year is adopt OKRs. 
So. Yep, and they're in a trial with us right now. It's fantastic. Lisa, do you have some thoughts here as well? So just sort of adding to that question of how you uh, get buy-in on the team, I'm very blessed that uh, we get to hear so many emails and people sharing stories with us on our social media about how you persuade an organization to embrace it little by slow, as they say in the South, uh, if, if you don't have the top down. Um, I have a great story from a banking team that is used to being run in a very hierarchical way because there's always a lot of risk uh, aversion in, in, in all of that. And what they did was they took a strategic team and they went to the leadership and said, we know you don't have time to meet with us. This is what we're going to do. And they didn't call it OKRs, but they used OKR thinking. And they were like, if you'd like to discuss this with us, uh, now's your chance. Otherwise, this is what we're going to do. And it turned out that they ended up delivering the results. And, and, and now a team of 12,000 is in the process of, of rolling it out. So um, the, the clear thinking and clear articulation, particularly when things are chaotic, you don't have the time to run down the hall. Um, we're seeing lots and lots of stories, um, which we're sharing on our website and, and encourage you to share with us. Fantastic. Here's a, here's a good question. It says, just from John, he said, do you have any examples of companies which have attempted several times to implement OKRs but failed, then approached it differently and succeeded? And, and, and we certainly do. Um, and, and what we've also tried to do as a provider of an app, a platform that enables OKRs to be rolled out, is we've also tried to fine tune the way that we try to help you in terms of the things we tell you to watch out for as you implement to start slowly. You know, uh, we use an analogy internally. You don't go to the gym and try to bench press 400 pounds the first time you walk in the gym. You need to build the muscle to support the ability to bench press 400 pounds. It's very true of OKRs too. Sometimes people use them more as an operational platform and it's not for that. It's for the most important big things, the big rocks that you want to make sure people are aligned to and start slowly and build up over time. And so sometimes people have gone out with a really gung-ho effort and it failed because it was just too much for people to adopt to. And so we, we can help you through best practices on trying to make sure we build a program that your culture can actually adopt to. I don't know, John, if you want to answer, Ryan and Lisa have any comments there too. I do want to add a couple more comments to that. One is, you know, we were talking about how you get the organization to adopt it. My very blunt advice is if the leader of your business unit or the CEO of the overall organization is not really committed to this, don't bother. Don't try. Yeah. But if they're going to work it into how they achieve excellence, how they make their people better, how they run their staff meetings. I mean, if, if, if you're in a meeting at, at Google and somebody says, we're going to do this new thing, I promise you somebody else in the team says, well, what key result are we going to, are we going to drop it's in order to, oh, there's Siri. <laughs> so, so these are not a silver bullet. It's not a magic elixir. What it is, I, I like to think of OKRs as transparent vessels into which we pour the values that matter to us. It is not the sum of all tasks. It's the few things that you at whatever level you're in as the organization, writing them for yourself, writing them for your team, writing them for the whole company, what you believe matters the most. And they don't all have to line up in a hierarchical way. You, you certainly couldn't have 100,000 people at Google cascading their key results, waiting for each level to do it. So the executive team sets out broad goals and directions that are measurable. People are aware of that, and then they write and publish their own. It's, it actually ends up being fun to do, to, to, to see everybody aligned. Yeah, as a company, John, it's been fantastic to see when a company really builds that muscle, like an Intel, and, and, and I'm sorry, an Intuit, where the entire company now gets it and it just operates how it, it's how it operates. Hey, um, so there's a question out there, Ryan, I think you want to address, but it's from Brett Knowles, who's an OKR specialist in himself, to be honest. So great question for us, Brett. Thank you. Brett, wonderful question. The question is, in these times, should we refresh our OKRs more frequently or still wait for the quarter end? Um, you know, the first batch of questions that we got back in March, right when this crisis was hitting, were for some folks saying, hey, my company is using OKRs and we're quite religious about them, but my manager is saying that we're still sticking to the goals that we set for this year. And, you know, 
we've never, none of us have lived through a crisis like this before. And so the encouragement that we give, you know, from the What Matters team is really around, absolutely, you should be reassessing the situation and your environment around you to refresh your OKRs based on the reality that's on the ground today. And that does mean refreshing your OKRs more frequently, looking at shorter time horizons and time scales. I mean, now more than ever, your company needs to be adapting. Your organization needs to be really nimble in these kinds of, you know, these days and weeks ahead where every week either gives us an indication things are going to be better or we've got to hunker down and find ways to get through the summer and into the fall. I know others on the call on, on, might have some reactions as well too to this question. I, I, I agree with that. I want to come back to an earlier question though, that someone asked, what's a good example of somebody starting, stopping, and then going again? And uh, the, the Nuna story is one, but so is the very eloquent story with Ann Wojcicki. And that's on this website. It's a video interview at What Matters. It's whatmatters.com. So check that out. They started, they struggled, they abandoned it. And then they came back to it and, and flat out say they couldn't run 23andMe without that tool. Hey, John, can you talk a little bit about goal attainment? You know, I, I mean, you know, you talked about audacious goals. You know, can you talk about that? I know you're passionate about that. Yeah, I think this is up to every team to pick its culture, its risk tolerance. And uh, some places, successful places have said, I want to set goals and have them achieved 100%. Others like Google say, no, I, I, want, I want it to be okay for people to have 10x kinds of goals. And shoot for Mars. Know that if they miss Mars, at least they'll get to the moon in the proverbial kinds of moon shots. The, the Googlers actually took it even further. Not only did they grade things as done, not done, half done, but they reduced them to decimal points, as you'd expect from really good engineers. And then they said, we're going to have two flavors of key results. We're going to have the committed ones, which you must achieve, for example, sales revenue targets might be a committed must achieve goal. And then we'll have stretch goals, which are aspirational. And we'll color code the two of them in different ways. Some can be red, some, some can be green. And, and so every, every organization that successfully adopted these, I like to say adapts them to their own culture in some way or another. Remember, not the sum of all tasks. It's to highlight the things that either really matter or that you just choose uh, deserve special emphasis. Hey, Lisa, here's a good question for you. It says a lot of managers are worried that members of their teams might be suffering in silence while working from home during these difficult times. How do you go about setting OKR related to well-being of their employees? So I think the What Matters team has had a lot of discussion about this. Um, and one thing that we've all been committed to is really having leaders and managers dedicate a set in OKR to check in with each of their employees and do active listening um, and, and embracing very much uh, that there needs to be time and space to be human first. Um, and, and honor wherever that, that person is. Um, most of, of the teams that we're talking to are finding themselves with uh, a lot of time at home. And, uh, and as well, um, many of them are kind of setting the goals of how much time can I set uh, to do some meditation, to do some yoga, how many times a week um, a, as a way of, of recognizing that the line between professional and personal is thinner than it has ever been. And so part of doing the work is admitting that your productivity um, is related to how kind you are to yourself and recognizing that as part of the work. So um, we share that in our newsletters, encourage people when they're doing their one-on-ones, when they're doing their team um, to, to set five minutes aside of every meeting um, dedicated to checking in. Um, these are the kinds of things that we think can add some of the ritual back from, from you know, seeing your favorite person in the office. Yeah, actually at BetterWorks, we, we maybe take it one step further. I, and I think a best practice that we share with most companies is it's important that most people, we, and the recommendation is three to five goals. You know, you don't want 20, it's three to five important goals. 
but maybe three of them are what you're trying to accomplish for the company and, and what you're driving forward for the company, but then pick one or two that are for you and have the manager sit with you and build a developmental goal for you. So you're achieving what you want to achieve organizationally for the company you're working for. But then we also encourage everybody in our company to build one that's a personal one, whether that's, you know, whatever it might be, you know, more exercise, lose weight, whatever it might be, you know, take an hour. I've encouraged people to have an OKR to take an hour a day to go be with the kids, go for a walk. You know, that can, that can be an OKR. And so one step further. And you can have private goals as well that are part of part of the system that are tracked. I remember a a personal story when, uh, when my two girls were growing up, a a top objective of mine and my wife was to have a healthy family. And uh, we read and believed that a healthy family had to do with having dinners together. And so I set a stretch goal to be home for dinner 20 nights a month by 6.30 and be fully present so that I turned off the screens at that period of time. And I shared that goal with my own small team and it was hard. It was a stretch goal. But uh, uh, So I, I'd encourage people now at this point, um, you know, send in questions if you have them. There's still quite a few here, John. Um, um, could, could, should comp should your compensation structure be tied to, to, to successful OKs or OKRs? And if so, how do you handle unattained stretch goals that might be interpreted as you did not meet expectations? So I strongly recommend not connecting OKRs with your compensation system because it will inevitably lead to sandbagging. If you want a risk-taking entrepreneurial go-for-it culture, the social pressure will, will be more than enough to get people to uh, perform. Having said that, something like revenue for sales can and should be part of a commission plan. And that can be in the OKR system. So remember, this is a tool. There's no hard and fast rules. And you can have some common measures that are in both. John, the only thing I would add to that is you certainly don't want to use it hard line for did you achieve a goal that's tied to comp? But, you know, there's a lot of other things that make up somebody's body of work and who they are as a human being and their brand in an organization. It's, it's all of those things combined together that can potentially inform compensation. But if you make it all about goal attainment, that's a really bad quality to, yep. to do. Uh, here's one that's an important one for me too, John, to be able to explain to people. Can you ex- uh, expand on the difference between cascading and aligning OKRs? Sure. Uh, The book that you'll get if you send me an email shows an example of those in the form of a soccer team. But uh, cascading goals are those that are handed top down, whereas the bottom up way of goal setting is, uh, is preferable, honestly, or at least a mix of them. A healthy OKR system finds the majority of goals are set bottoms up having seen a big picture of where the whole organization is going. That's exactly the right thing. Um, This is also a very good question. How to help managers in having high quality conversations with direct reports, not just run them and click the box. Uh, You take that one, Doug. I I will take that one. Um, You know, we have a saying internally, we can make managers better managers by forcing them, if you will, through the application to having four face-to-face conversations with employees. What we can't do is make them be good conversations. So there still needs to be an effort internally at a company to teach people how to have high quality conversations. One of the things that we are excited about that we will do is provide video vignettes inside of the application that no, we know you have a conversation coming up and this is the date. We can send you an email with a small video clip of, and we know the rating of the individual potentially or how you're feeling about that person, that we can send you a small clip on how to have a difficult conversation with somebody around an OKR or how to give praise in this conversation. You know, I, I know a lot of companies today, we're giving the advice of really the conversation city, today should be more about listening than talking. It's how are you doing? It's about getting people, at least to your point, is really getting to share how they're feeling about being at home and being isolated from work and potentially from family. All right. 
Any other comments on that, guys? You're welcome to pipe up. There's a good piece on alignment, um, Lisa, with the team at Beam Dental, I think worth sharing, right, around misalignment. Do you want to share that? Sure. Um, I think last week we just, uh, or a couple of weeks ago, we published a story about, uh, it's actually a Kleiner Perkins portfolio company named Beam um, that is reinventing the um, dental service in healthcare. And um, what was going on, to your point about top-down and bottom-up discussion, was they were noticing that these two teams just kept uh, quibbling and quibbling and quibbling. And it got, it felt almost personal. We all know um, we all know organizational politics, but uh, to their credit, uh, the executive team kind of took a step back and said, what's going on? These are all good people, recognized that the OKRs were actually misaligned and, and directly opposing each other. And this bottom-up feedback caused the executive team to completely rewrite their objectives. Um, and in fact, backing off of a specific metric and going back to the aspirational um, uh, qualities of it. So it would give more uh, a power to the individual teams and cause them to find uh, actual alignment. So um, it's just, it's a nice simple, and it, and it didn't take that long. It was that they were able to find where, where the opposing points of view were very quickly and then zoom out in order to, to, to release uh, all the talent. So there's a lot of questions. Um, could the objectives also be measurable or just the KRs? Why or why not? Uh, properly chosen KRs will cover the objectives. What I mean by that is if you achieve the KRs and they're well designed, you will by definition achieve the objectives. So the place to get to the numeric detail is in the how. And one of the subtle powers of this that I, is if at a team level you choose the objectives, you can let the individuals come up with the best hows. What I mean by that is we all know in business, there's often several right answers. And so when my doctor, who has the objective of making me healthy, tells me to run a marathon, it's way less effective than if I choose to run the marathon as the way of getting healthy. So that, that decoupling of the objective from the key result really encourages ownership, innovation, and operating excellence. We do see, we do see as we work with larger organizations where the, the comment around alignment versus cascading, a lot of times what might happen a couple layers down in an organization is the KR for a top company objective actually might be promoted to an objective for a layer down or two, and then KRs are associated to that, and the application allows you to do that. Uh, maybe, guys, we're down to four minutes here, and we want to be honor your time uh, appropriately. Um, John, maybe we, we want to just uh, make a couple comments in closing here with the presentation and I'll remind people of the offer, the generous offer that you have, because I think maybe some people joined us late, too. So, Well, for sure. I hope you can uh, still see the screen. Uh, I have a few of these books, and nothing would make me happier than for them to be in your hands or a key executive in your organization or your team. And if you'll send me an email to this mail address with uh, your three favorite books or that have changed your life, I'll respond with a copy of these slides. Uh, please also send me a home address where, if you're comfortable with that, where I can uh, send these books. And, uh, and if you'd like a second book for your favorite school principal or head of a nonprofit or something, uh, put their name for an inscription in it as well, and I'll, I'll send them both along. I was given a great gift in 1975. Andy Grove introduced me and hundreds of others at Intel to this goal setting system. And so I've, I've just always wanted to pay it forward to pass it along. And uh, I, I, think, uh, I think that's, that's it, John. You, you, you're doing a wonderful job of that, my friend. And I'm yeah. honored to work by your side. Um, here, here is a couple of other webinars, folks, if you want to join us again and continue this conversation that are upcoming for us, to you, all of you. Uh, but I want to thank John and Lisa and Ryan for participating and all of you for joining us uh, in these incredible times that we're trying to live through. So I appreciate everybody. And I'll say thank you for everybody for joining.
We're going to keep the uh, session up for just a moment. Somebody requested that we put that email address in the chat. So do you want to do that, Ryan? I did that, John. The other thing, everybody, is we're sending an email out tomorrow where you'll have a link to click that you can fill out the three books in your name and we'll ship you a book that way too. So you don't have to just email John. You can do it through an email link that we'll send you tomorrow. That'll be great. And if you found this session valuable or how we could make it better, let us know. We'll, we'll, do, another, we'll, do, an, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do another one for folks you invite to attend. Sounds good. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Goodbye. Be safe. Thank you, John.